You are listening to the Southwestern American Choral Directors Association Connections podcast, where we will interview choral directors, leaders, and movers and shakers within our region. I'm your host, Dr. Jeff Wall. We hope you enjoy these conversations. Please like and subscribe this YouTube channel for future content. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Connections Podcast from the Southwestern American Choral Directors Association. Today, I get the great pleasure to talk to Christy Carey Miller. Uh, she is our r and chair for middle level and uh, junior high. So it was a really fun conversation, and I think you're going to get a lot out of it. Um, a little bit about Christy. Uh, Christy Miller is internationally regarded as a master teacher, conductor, composer, and arranger a grad of Oklahoma State University and spent over 40 plus years in education, uh, teaching K through 12. Uh, through her teaching, she has received numerous awards and honors in education, ranging from District Teacher of the Year to Oklahoma Music Educators Association, Excellent Educator, and including the OKMEA Music Educator Hall of Fame. Uh, please enjoy my wide ranging conversation with Christy Carey Miller. Uh, hello everybody, I'm here with Christy Carey Miller, and uh, welcome to the show. Uh, just wanted to give you an opportunity, first of all, to tell us uh, a little bit about you and what you do in the world. Well, I am presently a uh, teacher, middle school teacher at Heritage Hall Middle School, and that's in Oklahoma City, but it's a private school. Um, I'm teaching fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, but this is my 44th year of teaching so uh, I'm kind of seasoned if you could say that I'm probably there yeah but I'm loving my my job and I love my work which is why I'm not retired yet and um, so that's a little bit about me right now okay so now tell us a little bit about your role with uh, Southwestern ACDA and what you're going to be doing for us and uh, maybe any initiatives or anything you're excited about well I'm first of all extremely honored to be asked to be a part of this pretty spectacular group of people. I'm excited about meeting some of these people that I have known about and followed in the past and, and associating with them. I think you learn the most from people that you're with, and uh, I'm excited about that. I am going to be representing the middle school junior high division and uh, of the choral world, and hopefully I can share insight because I am a middle school teacher so I understand your pains and I understand all of the um, situations that you're dealing with. I am lucky that I am in a smaller environment because it is a private school. So my numbers are not as, as big as many of you I'm sure have. My uh, classroom management doesn't have to be as tight, although it is good because you have to keep going, but it doesn't have to be in the larger sense. So I have that. but. I hope that I can share my insights for that. I want to try to research and find some good articles that would benefit the middle school teachers. I want to be able to, you know, bring in or what at least make some suggestions on people that I think would be beneficial for the middle school world. I think middle school teachers so often get neglected. There's the elementary world. They have a lot, a lot of resources and really great uh, folks that are there. Then you have the uh, high school world, which and the college world, where you've got some wonderful directors and music that goes there. But then this middle school world, you know, we're we're in such an awkward stage anyway. We've got kids that don't even know who they are yet, and they're trying to figure it out. And you you've got to not only deal with chorally and vocally because their voices are changing so much. You have to deal with them socially and how they're dealing with themselves and helping them find who they are. And uh, so it's not just a matter of music, but it's a matter of finding music that helps relate to issues they're dealing with. And I hope that maybe I can be a catalyst for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can. And, and that resonates with me right now just because uh, I have, well, I taught, I taught junior high for a while before I started with the more terminal degrees, but um, my oldest right now is, is going through all the middle school changes. So, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a new chapter for us here as parents too. So I get that, but as a, you called yourself seasoned, that just means you have a lot of flavor and, uh, <laughs> I, I think you're going to be a great resource for, for folks to, to come to with, uh, with all the flavor. So, uh, we're, we're glad that you're in that role and, um, going to be able to have, uh, be a resource for people to reach out to. Um, okay, so what is your uh, piece of music that you think 
and this doesn't have to be choral, but what piece of music do you think best embodies your personality? Oh, you know, I, I have so many sides to my personality. If I'm in a, in a sad mood, then I need something like, uh, you know, that can pull in all of my emotions chorally. Um, let's see. I, I think that the part that probably resonates with me most is the songs that are about what music means to you as an individual. Those are the songs that resonate with me the most. And I can cry in it. Why We Sing, uh, Greg Gilpin's piece. Uh, Come to the Music, Joseph Martin's piece. Those things have to be a part of who I am. Because whenever I'm singing, I'm like, and this is why I'm a director. This is why I'm in music. So those are probably my go-to uh, things. Gotcha. I think those are good choices. All right. So um, along those same lines, what is your desert island coral piece? Maybe one that uh, you would be stranded on an island for for uh, extended extended period of time. That's the only one you can live with on loop. So what would that be? You know, it it, and I think probably a lot of people will resonate with this too. It is really what you're kind of working on at the time because it starts becoming a part of you. Now, I do agree that there are a couple of things, choral things that I'll get back out and I was like, oh my gosh, this was such a great thing. But right now, the song that has been resonating with me and I could listen to it a dozen times over is Roger Emerson's Both Sides Now. He just did um, a piece that's good for SATB, SAB, SSA, and two parts. And I just wanted my uh, women's chorus to experience that song. They're not as familiar with it. Joni Mitchell is somebody they need to know about. And so if I were going to do a loop song, it would be that right now. In fact, I, probably what I have been doing. I go home and listen to it, and I listen to it on the way back, uh, to school back and forth. So that's my Desert Island song. Probably last year it would have been Times They Are a Change In by the Pod Brothers, that arrangement. So it's just kind of whatever is in my um, workstation. And I can't leave out the fact that I know I only get one song on the island and everything, but um, I love whatever I am working on, whatever quarrels I'm writing, that just lives with me in the night and through the day, and I keep looping it over whether I want to or not. So a little bit of that is there too. So I have my own things that I would loop around and carry with me. Yeah, of course. And we'll give you an exception. <laughs> we'll let you loop a couple of them there. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. So uh, then do you have a particular philosophy of programming for maybe your own program or, or choirs that you may clinic? Uh, what's your idea there? Well, it depends on how big pieces you get to select. And that will make a difference. But if let's say that the normal programming was six pieces you know for my i am one of those that and i think i learned this from mac huff he is so good at programming and understanding how to put something together that will emotionally invoke you know things feelings from people but i'd start with a, a bigger number or something that's intriguing it doesn't have to be big but it has to be different or calling where the audience wants to lean in a little bit and uh, generally mine are something that's a little bit bigger uh, Ryan Maines, Do You See You Day is a really great one for my middle school um, festivals that I have done and directed. I'm going to do one in Kentucky and we're going to start with that one again because it's just got so much meat to it. So, and the kids love that too. So we're going to start with that one. And then I like to go with something that's a little more uh, classical so that you have a chance to experience um, the artists of our past that gave us some great music that they probably wouldn't experience on their own. Uh, then I might go with uh, something that is uh, comical or in that light. Doesn't have to be funny lyrics. It doesn't have to be that, but maybe something that is lighthearted or um, in that sense. Uh, I might stick another um, six, eight piece in there if I haven't got anything going or modal or something minor if, that if I'm missing that at that particular point. And then right before the end, I'm going to put that ballad in there that is just very moving, that's going to touch people's hearts, that are going to make them just really lean in and say, oh my gosh, this is beautiful. And there's my child up there singing and I'm so happy. I'm happy that they get to experience that. And then of course, we're going to finish with something big. 
And um, it has to be, it might be something that involves drumming. It might be something that involves a little choreography. It might be, um, you know, it just, it could be an abundance of things. Uh, but um, I like to kind of finish with that. And then if I can go back and recycle that ending after the applause is happening, if I can just have that pianist play the punch line and then sing that ending again, that's sort of a nice way to put the ending onto the program. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that's a, a great formula that you've just laid out for, for all of us that we could all follow. Um, and I, it sounds like you're programming not only for the singers that are in front of you, but also for the audience. Um, or for me. I have to program for, uh -huh. for what, what turns my emotions, what makes me want to do it. And a lot of times when I'm picking selections, and even for my own choirs, I will you know, put those songs in order and uh, on a playlist and listen to them and then um, um, see how that turns me on. So that's my thing. Uh, yeah, you mentioned your answer, Ryan Main, and he's not a sponsor of the of the podcast or anything, but um, a friend. So um, I, I think he's, a lot of people. He's would... pretty spectacular. Yeah, and the Dia Theory, of course, is That's one of his most popular pieces. But uh, he's got everything um, for all levels and multiple voicings for for his pieces. So I encourage everybody to go look at at uh, those compositions as well. Well, you know, and Kyle Pedersen kind of does the same thing. He has that same sort of energy and creative out of the box corals that he's done and anything of his hands are knocking is just a terrific little come together song that just does it for me another one of those that I, when i was teaching it looped it and looped it looped it and listened to it so he's another great composer and i know people who know about him so it's not like it's new news but uh if you don't know about him look him up because he's worth your time yeah i agreed on both of them um, okay, so how, how would you describe maybe what a typical rehearsal might look like under your direction? Well, again, I'm coming from a middle school uh, point of view. Right, and well, that's what we want to hear. Sixth... We want to hear from your point okay, of view. Okay, yeah. well, we just finished with the sixth grade rehearsal, and these are kids that haven't really had any choral um, programming. They've done general music, and I'm their general music teacher in fifth grade, but they, they kind of want to keep it general music through fifth grade, and then they get to decide in sixth grade if they want to do strings or choir and so getting them into uh, the choir mode it takes a lot of tricks so um, what we do generally with our sixth graders I start with them some sort of energy song and it might be uh, as simple as uh, you know a rooster shot a rooster shot a rooster shot shot where they do something fun and funny and it's usually I like to make it so that it's totally different they don't know it so they're not ready to expect anything and they're just like what is this so we'll do something that gets their energy going and maybe their voice is engaged and then we will uh, do some pedagogical uh, vocal exercises where if I've got a song that I need, we're doing a song called I See the Moon. So we've got to do a lot of linear things and moon and see, you know, we've got to make those things happen. So we'll do an exercise. I like to have them do a lot of kinesthetics as they're uh, warming up so that they can connect that. Uh, we may do two or threes that will relate to whatever the songs that we're going to be rehearsing. And then I will have them for sure. We will sing through a couple of rounds because they're just getting used to uh, harmonic singing. And uh, we'll do it as, uh, in big groups. And then I will might I might isolate them and do it. Okay, row one to two, row two, row to three. And then I might say, okay, partner up, and one of you is going to be part A, and one of you is going to come in the second half. So we try to get that harmony so they understand it. I mean, and we talk about singing so that they can hear themselves. I mean, they have to practice that because it is the, one of the most challenging things that we do. After we do that, I will uh, let them sit down for a minute and then we will start our sight singing because I've got to get them used to reading music. We might do flashcards. We might do rhythm football. We might do um, something. Uh, right now, they're going through the solfege challenge, the sixth graders are. And that basically is because they're not used to hand signs and I use them. They need to, and they've learned them some in fifth grade, but they don't come to me with anything. They know about solfege names. They don't know the hand signs. So 
fifth grade, we work a little bit just on the basics and try to get pentatonics down. And But still, it's very awkward, and they are um, just doing general music, and you know, it's not as much time as I'd like to have them. In the, so sixth grade, the Solfege channel, Challenge basically is they have to do the hand signs all the way up, and then we put a metronome on, and we compete. So they see if who can be the fastest to do that in each row. And it does take a little time, but we'll just do row one on one day and then row two. Make the metronome go up 10 uh, beats per minute um, each time to see who we can eliminate. So we do a little gaming that way. And then after I get them used to their hand signs, then we'll start doing a lot more sight singing. They're already doing rhythm reading, so it's not like they're not doing sight singing because I think that's essential and I think it needs to happen every class period somehow. So I always put SOS in my planning book, which is sing on sight. Um, so we'll do something in that realm. And then after that, we'll stop and talk. Maybe we have announcements because they need to have that reboot always going. And then we will go back to a song that we have already rehearsed so they know it. And I will have two or three concepts that I want to bring out about that particular song. So when we introduce a song, those are the concepts I, I talk about immediately. Like, I see the moon is 6-8. We need to know what that is and how does it work and what does 6 mean and what does 8 mean and that. So we go through a lot of those. Now, what we developed in our school is a thing like Harry Potter's world of house points. Uh, when they went to Hogwarts, they divided them up into four groups, and they were the different houses. Well, we have the same thing. Our school theme is called Evolve and Grow. And so um, the art teacher, the computer teacher, and myself took all of our students, fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth grades, and we divided them into houses. And they're tree houses. So it's the Birch House, the Oak House, the Magnolia House, and the Evergreen House. And in each of my grades, in each of the classes, there are about equal numbers. So every class has representation from all of those four tree houses. So as we're reviewing concepts, if somebody gets the right answer, I get to ask them, what is your house? If they tell me they are birch, then they get a point down for that, which is a big thing because everybody in the, house, in the classroom, if they're birch, they're like, yay, they think they got the right answer too. They all wanna be contributors like that. So we talk about concepts when we get into the songs we've already done. What do you remember? It's important for you to remember that's a two-point answer, that's a three-point answer, just to kind of get them going. And then we will sing through what they already know. If, in this case today, they hadn't learned the B section of that little song, so we had to kind of go through that. What lines are the same? What lines are different? Which, where does it change? I always tell them, you know, it's as important for me to train your ear as it is for me to train your voices. Because truly, you cannot sing unless your ear knows what it's supposed to hear what it's hearing. I said, you know, when you're babies, you don't just jump out and say, hey, mom, dad, yo, thanks for having me. You know, the parents spend a whole year looking at you saying, say, mama, mama. And once they, but that little baby hears what they're supposed to do, then they're able to repeat. So I said, a lot of times we're gonna do ear training things in here. So we do a lot of things. So what did you hear? Is it different? Because I need to train those ears. And I said, I, I really feel like kids, especially middle school, they hold themselves responsible if they can't sing something right. Their voices are very personal. But if they can't hear it right, it's, they're not as offended because somehow they don't have control over the hearing. And I tell them, some of you have had better experiences with your ears and hearing these things than others. So I know I'm kind of getting on a tangent there, but that's what music teachers do. Anyway, we will uh, talk about hearing things and the way we'll do that. Then after we've done a couple of those, I'll do a brain break. So because they've got to reboot. So it's do this, do this, do this, do this, do that. And if they do that, because it's like Simon says, then they're out. Well, they like that, change it. It doesn't even have to be necessarily a music thing. That's a direction following thing, and they're looking and listening, so those are important concepts for choir. After we do the reboot, then I might introduce a new song. It depends on how much time I have left. In this case, I didn't, but we tried to learn or go back through a song, another song that we were singing. We're doing Roger Emerson's If I Were a Fish in sixth grade. The reason that is important is because it talks about the fact that if we were to find a fish or a rock 
or a seashell or anything, and it's totally different than anything we've ever seen, we would hold that as the biggest prize we've ever found. And we would show that to people and tell people about it and be so happy and proud about that. But if we have students in our school who are totally different, they wear different clothes, they have different hair color, they have different things they say, they look different, they have a deformity, then we shy away from them or we think they're weird. So why is it that we're okay with things that are special that are material but not with human beings which is why the song was written to begin with because the girl that wrote it uh a they she was a, they were really uh discriminated against and it came from the internet so in the song it says why is everybody on the internet so mean that is important for the kids to know hey this applies to you so we we sang that as our ending today kind of as a way to you know, leave it. And then our rehearsal today ended with a fire drill. 36 of us all going outside at the same time. <laughs> but anyway, that's sort of how do I like to, I like to leave them with something fun. And then if we have some time at the end, I might uh, play a little music game, maybe Poison Rhythm, maybe Pass the Beat Around the Room, maybe, um, oh, there's another one like Extra Beat, Take a Seat. Those are all fun little games they want to ask to do again and again. So we'll do that. Older ones, the rehearsal's a little more focused and concentrated. I don't have to go to the gimmicks as much because they know the routine. We spend a little bit more time sight singing. Uh, we sing a little more serious songs. We take longer to get through it, but I still do the brain breaks. I still do the energizers. I still do something fun with them so that they have that experience of saying, oh, choir is so much fun. And thank you for doing that. Not that I just want it to be fun. I want them to learn, but I think if they're having fun, they'll have a desire to learn. Yeah, absolutely. I think you just gave us a little mini masterclass. Um, oh, wow. And, yeah. Well, this is, uh, this is my, um, you know, as a, as a teacher of teachers, and, uh, you know, training our music ed students, I'm going to make them watch this episode. Uh, I think <laughs> it's important. I mean, you, you basically gave everything. And I don't think there's anything that's all that different from, you know, collegiate teaching uh, from, you know, middle, middle and junior high level. Uh, it's all kind of the same things that we do. But, you know, you were great about highlighting, you know, reinforcement of, um, of learned ideas and materials, um, new stuff, mixing that up together, uh, brain breaks, hearing, sight reading. Uh, character building, you know, all of those things, but you're doing it through the music. So I, I think everything you said is just, you know, dart right in the bullseye. So thank you for that. Right, great. I hope so. I mean, in 44 years, you got to get something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're, you're doing it. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> uh, this kind of ties in, but what maybe are some pointers that you would have for an emerging choral leader? Uh, you know, I think the ones that are doing it, this is not going to be anything new to them, but you have got to listen and learn all the time. Don't ever pass up an opportunity to go hear a choir, watch, there's so many wonderful YouTube videos on ways to learn from really great directors. Um, anytime you can go to workshops, do that and really the car ride with your fellow choir directors is just as important as the workshop itself. Anytime you can soak up information and I know that you know I used to have a lot of student teachers I don't get to do that in the private school world anymore but when I was teaching public school I had student teachers two or three every year and they would just come in overwhelmed like how do I do this. I can't ever do, I can't do what you do. And I said, and I hope the heck not because I've been doing this a long time, but do what you can do well, get really good at it and get criticisms. Let people hear what you're doing and tell you what you're doing wrong. Be open to that. But then every year add two or more, two or three more things that you, you get better at. Don't try to do all of it the same year. Because you can't. And that's really what makes so many of them frustrated. I think, I can't do that. I've never done that. Well, you will be able to. But none of us were superwoman or superman when we were uh, first starting out. There are a few exceptions that do do a really fabulous job. But I sort of like I tell my middle school choir kids, you know, of all of you guys that are in here, 
of all of you guys that are here in my room, only this many of you are really talented. The rest of you are learning. And you're going to get better, and it's my job to put you up here. But friends, when I was in middle school, this is where I was, down here. Okay? And you have to let choir directors that know that too. You are not going to get it right away. But if you just are eager to learn and continue to want to learn, then you will be fabulous. That's excellent advice. Yeah. And uh, I mentioned this on a, another recording. It hasn't been released yet, I don't think. But um, I, the same thing I say to my, my students is, you know, it's not that it's particularly difficult. It's just that you haven't done it enough. And, you know, you got you to gotta have some repetition in, and some years in, some time in uh, before you start realizing some things intuitively. And uh, those things will come. But, you know, it's, you're not going to be great at this when you first start. You, you're just not. And uh, that's that's the process. And that's the beauty of, of the whole profession is the process. Right. So in in your in your 44 years of teaching and where you are in life, uh, then what general advice would you give to yourself? as your young 16 year old self? <laughs> um, probably the same advice I just gave to a young emergency teacher. Don't stop. Yeah, that's fair. That's Don't fair. stop learning. Um, because there's all, there are always going to be things for us to get. Now, I do know there's a lot of times I'll go to a conference and I will avoid a workshop thinking, oh, I've seen so many of those already. I don't know if I could absorb any more. But if I ever do make myself go there, I'm like, okay, I forgot about that. That's a good point. Uh, and I need to keep doing that. That's one thing. The second thing to my old self is that I need to make sure I know what's happening with these young kids. What are they listening to? What technology are they out there doing? I need to be able to relate to them about what they know in their world. And sometimes I get lazy about that. Now I have granddaughters and they're at that age that I'm teaching. So I hear a little bit from that, but so often I crawl back into my, you know, when I leave school, I crawl back in my little corner of my little comfort zone and I don't really understand, you know, what's, what's what's going on and so every once in a while if I can sneak in and find out or talk to kids and, and listen then I you know I think that's one of the things that is probably my biggest problem is I don't know what I'm not aware and I need to be more aware of what things they're really digging and I usually find that from young teachers on Facebook so they're teaching me something you know I'll read about something I'm like what anyway what is that one? Uh, skibbity? Is that is that a big thing now? Skibbity, skibbity, Yeah, skibbity. that's that's uh, I'm that's gonna part. I have to learn more about that. Because, yeah, me too. Before uh, I start I, repeating it, I had no it, idea. Yeah, before I start repeating things, I need to look things up and make sure I know what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I'm gonna look that one up. But I was like, this I don't is know a the new. Language. Yeah, I don't, How did I don't it know. Even I, become popular? So. Right, I don't know the 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 new language. Um, yeah, that's that's excellent, excellent advice. Um, okay, so now if you could put yourself in your future shoes, say you're 90 years old or so, um, and you're looking back to where you are now, what advice do you think you would give yourself now? Um, <clears throat> I think I need to. <clears throat> I probably need to. Um, I wish sometimes I could, and I my. Friends around me say, no, you already do that, but I don't feel like I do. I feel like I could develop a better bond. There's sometimes there's some kids in my class that are quiet and they're, um, you know, withdrawn. And so I, have a, I don't have a relationship with them. And I, I, that's my, one of my goals this year is to point out in my own list of those kids that are quiet that I really don't know who they are. I really don't know anything about them. And I, I want to, I don't want to stop doing that. So I, I need to be better at that. So my old self is going to say, you could have made a difference. You could have made a difference to some of those kids if you'd have just gotten to know them. 
And, you know, so often I just kind of thought, well, they're quiet and I'm going to let them do their own thing. But really, maybe they need my, um, maybe they need my friendship. Maybe they need my uh, hellos and, and how are you doings? Um, to, it's so funny that this question came up. Uh, yesterday, I was reached, uh, somebody reached out to me on Facebook that was a student of mine the first two years I taught. So I was a high school director in Henrietta, Oklahoma. And fresh out of college, I taught middle, uh, junior high and high school, so 7 through 12. Uh, this young lady on Facebook was not a friend of mine, but she said, are you Miss Carrie that used to teach in Henrietta? And so I responded, yes, that's me. And I didn't remember her, but I think she has a married name, and she didn't give me her maiden name. But she said, I remember you because uh, Joanna Schick and I, we didn't have anything to wear to the concert. And you took us to your little apartment on the hill and found two outfits in your closet and let us wear those. And that was the nicest thing anything anyone had ever done. I'm thinking, first of all, I put two kids in my car. <laughs> thinking, that was stupid. And secondly, I took them to my apartment. Oh my gosh. Times were different then. But, you know, oh my gosh, where where is that old self that did that? Now, I I try to make that happen to kids. I try to find them whenever I can, but I was different then. And I want to kind of find that same person. I think she maybe cared about some people more than this one does. So I'm going to make that my goal this year. Yeah, I think that's great advice. Um, yeah, I, I find myself in similar situations and uh, similar mindsets there thinking about that because it's um, sometimes in this profession we can get a little jaded, you know, and we, it was a little bit different time. Uh, but, you know, we we need to keep that humanity in in what we do. And I, I think um, you just highlighted that very well. So, uh, OK, so many people may know you as composer arranger just by name recognition. Uh, but as an educator or maybe as a composer arranger, maybe you can talk a little bit about what it looks like when you're in the zone or when you're working on a passion project. What does that look like for you? Well, I think a lot of music people relate to this, or even art people. When I get on a project, I lose track of time. I just get so, it's like I enter this world that's swirling around me. And all my imagination is just going crazy. I, you know, I just, it's like I'm floating in the most beautiful place. I think we all kind of get there. And I do that when I'm working on my music. I'll go upstairs and work for hours. And it's just like, where did that time go? I can do the same thing in my classroom when I'm working on a project. OK, let's get this program done. Or how are we going to do this or that? If I get really involved, involved in it and I get to cut loose on that creative part of me, that's it's just it's a I think that's why we're teachers. I think that's why we're musicians. I think that's why we do what we do because we've had that feeling and understand it. It's just that zone. I'm married to a non-musician. It's not good as far as him understanding that part of me. I mean, I try to explain it to him. I think he loves football and I think that he, you know, gets in his own uh, MO of things, but, um, he doesn't get that. And I think as music teachers, we have that wonderful sanctuary spot that we rely on to keep us centered. And that's sort of where that takes me. Yeah, it sounds like uh, what a lot of other realms describe as flow state. Um, so that's a kind of a, a buzzword that's going on right now. And as an athlete myself, um, that might be something your husband resonates with is getting into that flow state as an athlete. That's kind well, of what you probably do. would understand that, you know, because yeah. it is a uh, buzzword for a lot of athletes. So. Right. So I think that's, that's kind of what you're describing here. Um, okay. So uh, picture yourself now in a like sanctioned WWE style wrestling uh, situation with a four person tag team of 
choral directors in like a clinic or a session, who are the three other choral directors you'd like in your corner? My gosh, there are just so many. That That is a hard, hard uh, selection. You know, I, I got to thinking about that. Um, I so admire Rollo Dilworth, and he's a good friend. So not only could I use him and watch his style and how he works, he just is so commanding, and he's he's just got this wonderful sense of humanity that he could provide me with lots of insight that I wouldn't have thought about. And then I think about Henry Leck, and I love the way he relates to kids, his joy of life, the way he, I, I want that, I want him, I want to be around that because I feel like, and even though he's not as active as a director, his, uh, and you know, in his painting retired, retired state, uh, he still is someone that I feel has been just a magnificent influence to lots of people and to me when I've watched him. And then the third one is going to be Emily Crocker because she has so much knowledge uh, that she instills in people. And I am constantly amazed at how wise she is. And she's she's so she's so hip i mean she's just she's got so much about her but her knowledge as a director she she just has such great insight so that would be sort of where i'd go with those three biggies and that and there's i'm gonna say there's a lot of directors you know uh randall stroop and some just really wonderful people that i've seen direct that are good friends uh, roger emerson i mean those are um great friends and uh, directors, but probably those three that I talked to. Yeah, well, you just listed some some coral giants there, so I don't think you can go wrong with that match. I think you're going to win. Um, okay, so this is sort of adjacent to that, but uh, maybe a coral musician that you'd like to lift up that doesn't get as much attention or eyes on them as, uh, as you think they deserve. You know, I'm going to I'm going to mention somebody that is not known probably in the big coral world, but he is known in our state. And uh, it's because of his magnificent programs, and I've just seen what he does. His name is Wes Singleton, and I think that he is just one of the most phenomenal directors. Uh, I wish he had enough recognition to be doing big workshops outside of the state of Oklahoma, but he is, you know, he can get and pull so much from kids. And the way he builds a program is remarkable. I just don't think that, I mean, our state of Oklahoma, we know, we know how great Wes is because he's served as the OKMEA president. He's had groups in lots and lots of honor car settings at our, at our conferences. Uh, and his choirs consistently just knock it out of the park. But I wish other people in other states had an opportunity to have him come in and workshop with their kids or direct their festivals because I don't think that he gets the recognition that he absolutely uh, deserves. And um, so that would be my person I would push. Yeah, yeah, hard agree on that. And, you know, knowing Wes and kind of having a bird's eye view of his, his, uh, his work and hearing his choirs, um, if you're looking for a clinician, Wes Singleton, reach out. Um, uh, I think uh, that would be, he'd be great. It'd be awesome oh, for your choir. In yeah. so many ways. And if you want to know how to recruit boys, get Wes Singleton there. If you want to know how to make uh, a program work successfully, get Wes. If you want to have a choir, you want to have a really great sounding choir, get Wes, Wes Singleton. Because I've seen him do all of those things and I'm, always getting ideas from him, but I'm thinking, I can never be him. I could never be, I'm like that poor young, oh, how can I do what you do? I can't, his ear is so good. His skills are truly amazing, so. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, so final question before we get into uh, what I like to call the Acceleronda round or, or a game that we'll play here with some quick fire questions. Um, but what do you do to relax or fight burnout? Uh, well, number one, 
Not very often unless I'm working on a program do I listen to music in the car. <laughs> I go home listening to talk radio, uh, NPR, or sports talk. I am a big sports fanatic. I love watching football. Uh, I grew up an athlete, so uh, that has been a big part of my life. In fact, when I was a senior in high school uh, from Newkirk, Oklahoma, there weren't very many kids that ever made Allstate, but I made Allstate, my uh, Allstate choir, my senior year, uh, because I could sight read, and that was one of the requirements. And I didn't go to Allstate because I had a basketball game. There's that. So, you know, I, I tell kids and understand a lot of that, but I am big on sports. Um, I love to um, get on my Facebook and look and see what life it looks like with other people. I love spending time with my grandchildren and my family. Those are important parts of my life. So that's kind of what I do. Yeah, that's great too. We, um, I'm trying to, to I mean, it's a common topic, but I'm trying to highlight for, especially our emerging choral leaders um, who get kind of immersed in our profession so much that uh, they lose track a little bit sometimes of, of real life and having hobbies, having friends and, you know, having a life outside of the, the work. Um, so I think it's always interesting to hear different people's takes on, on how they do that. Um, so now if you're game, we're, we're going to head into the Sachella Rondo round, just quick fire questions. Um, okay. Nothing you have to think too hard about, uh, but what's uh, the worst job well, you ever know. had? <laughs> what's the worst job you've ever had outside of choral music? <laughs> uh, a clerical job for uh, the county assessor when I was in college. Don't ever do that. That's not fun at all. <laughs> what, what was so bad about that? Well, it was just tedious. There wasn't any creativity that went into it. Uh, the same old, same old. Uh, the only thing I liked about it is that I made money. Gotcha. The repetition. Gotcha. Okay. So what's your guilty pleasure, bad food to eat then? Oh, wow. There are a lot of those. Ice cream. And I can eat it anytime. And I can eat it in any flavor. And I can eat any amounts of it. And I'm never full. So. Yeah. You said any flavor. I was about to ask what your favorite flavor was then. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm really addicted to Wendy's Frosties, this chocolate ones. But if I were going to go into a ice cream, you know, place that's got all the fun ice creams, there is a, a salted caramel thing that I get every once in a while at Boomtown Creamery in Oklahoma City. I think it's salted caramel, but that salt in the ice cream is just, oh, that's so good. Yeah, that saltier with the sweet. Yep. I may just My have wife to is... leave here. That. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my wife is a weirdo with the Wendy Fro Wendy's Frosty. She likes to dip her fries in them. So yep, that's how she gets that, that. that salty. Oh, like, I don't know. I can't do that. And then <laughs> Wendy's even came up with an orange, a dream sickle. Like it's, it was a seasonal thing. And uh, I, I was going by and getting one of those every day. <laughs> They're good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you had any other job to do besides being a musician of some kind, what would that be? A carpenter. Ooh, a I carpenter. Love to make things. Yeah. Well, that's I creative too. That's things. that's kind of creativity adjacent, right? So it's good. My husband says I wouldn't be very good at it, but I really think I would be. I love, you know, I have my own toolbox at home. I have my own drill and I love fixing things. Uh, I'm not always good at it, but I like to be the one to try to figure it out. Um, so I, I, I've always said to him, you know, if I wasn't a music teacher, I think I'd like to be a carpenter. He's like, that is the oddest thing I've ever heard, but I will. No, I think you'd be great at it. Yeah. Like I said, it's just a, you got to do it a lot and then you'd get great at right, it. Right. Uh, what is a movie or TV show that you think everyone should watch at least once? Um, ooh, mm -hmm. Coda. Maybe that's because I just showed it, the ending to my kids. You know, it's got both sides now in it, and it's a really great telling story. So I wanted them to hear that song, and then I thought, man, that is such a great movie. I need to get that back out and look at it, so I watched it again. So that is definitely one that I think is a great one for people to know. Um, golly, people, there's lots of them in the past. There's some musicals that all of, I think everybody needs to know, but for right now, I think it's Coda. Go watch it. 
Okay, perfect. Uh, okay, so you have a choice here. What is the, either the scariest moment in your life or what is your biggest phobia? Oh, hmm. Scariest moment in my life was probably the first time that I went scuba diving at Turks and Caicos because I just had this phobia about being underneath a lot of water and all of a sudden the tank would go out. So I'm a swimmer and I'm pretty uh, familiar with water, but for some reason that really scared me. But it was one of those things I did and it was the most fantastic experience I have ever had in my life. So there is a good lesson. It was something I didn't think I could do and I did get my certification in Oklahoma in a muddy pond. So I figured if I could do that, I could definitely go down the water in Turks and Caicos. And even though a baby shark decided to look at me, you know, six feet away, it was still very cool. <laughs> That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, the that's a common phobia, I think, the vastness of the ocean underneath people, the the, the blackness of it, uh, people right. get scared of, get scared of. But uh, yeah, it's such a it's a beautiful experience if you're a ever able to do that kind of thing. Um, okay, so what is something you spend way too much money on? Oh, don't tell my husband. I spend way too much money on clothes, so just don't tell him because it comes from a different. Account. <laughs> that's funny okay great um uh what is a secret talent that most people would be surprised to learn about you uh oh do i have a secret talent oh i can do something with my shoulder blades that nobody else can do you want to see ready yeah let's see it can you see it i can't believe i just showed that to you i can't <laughs> believe i just did that and that's not really even a talent it's just like this weird thing that i can do with my body but it has come into play a lot of times if I want to get kids' attention, you know, I do that. And they're like, what did she just do to her body? So <laughs> afraid of the demon coming out of your back. Oh, I can do both of them. I mean, there was a thing, a show uh, that used to be out called America's Funniest People. Uh -huh. And they went all around the United States filming these people doing these odd things. And so they came to Oklahoma City, and I just decided I was going to audition using my shoulder blades. So I went to Oklahoma City, I mean, to Penn Square Mall in Oklahoma City. And they, if you had to sign up, I signed up. And then I went up on stage, and I, I whistled, do, 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 do. And I made my shoulder blades move to that. I mean, and they were like, what is she doing? So they filmed it a second time, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get on that show, right? This is really cool. And uh, afterwards, I came off the stage, and there was a lady from the Daily Oklahoman, and she had been sort of doing a story on all these people, right? And she said, you know, and of course, it's the back of me that moves. Both of them can go. And so she said, you know, it would have been a lot funnier if you would have just put a face on the back of your head. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, I didn't get on the show, but that is my hidden talent. And it's not really a talent, but it's just like this weird thing that I do. <laughs> I love it. It's that. kind of like a dislocation of the shoulder, it looks like, from there, from, from where I was sitting. <laughs> well, and the funny thing is, when I was in college, there was um, a friend of mine. She said, ah, I'm going to set you up with this guy. And I, I went to OSU. <clears throat> she was a good friend with this guy from OU. I'm going to set you up with this guy from OU. He is so much like you. I mean, he writes his own songs. He sings. He's athletic. I mean, you, you would make this perfect pair. I said, okay. So blind date. I get set up with him. And so we're in the car and talking to each other. And he says, I like such and such. I like that too. I've been to so-and-so. I've been there too. And we just had all these things in Hong Kong. And he said, but I bet I can do something that you can't do. And he does this shoulder thing, just like me. I said, I can do that. <laughs> so I did my shoulder thing. And then, you know what? After that date, we never had another date. <laughs> like, You're too, too much alike, too I guess. Too much alike. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, that opposites attract thing is real, I think. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that's awesome. Uh, what is the oldest thing in your fridge? <laughs> there are a lot of those things in my refrigerator. Uh, I probably have some uh, coconut milk that I bought to make some Thai soup. 
and I'm pretty sure it's probably six months old. And I don't know, I don't think it's still good anymore, but it's just one of those things like that. But maybe I do want to use it, you know? And then when I do get it out, I'm going to find out that it expired two years ago. I don't know. And I can't figure out why I keep those things in my refrigerator. Yeah, as uh, yeah, coral leaders and educators, yeah, as coral leaders and educators, I, I like that question because, you know, we get so busy, we forget things that, you know, are in the back of our fridge. Um, okay, so uh, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? Oh. Hmm. Uh, I think I'd like the superpower to read my husband's mind. Because he's not always good about communicating what he's really thinking. So, uh, communication being a barrier and in, in our marriage, occasionally, I would love to be able to have a superpower to read what the heck he is actually thinking or saying, or we finally get there, but it would be so much faster if I could have that figured out beforehand. I won't speak for your husband, but my wife says the same things, and I just have to say, there's not a whole lot, not a whole lot going on up there. <laughs> uh, Okay, great. So stealing, this is uh, stealing one from the Tim Ferriss podcast. If you're not familiar with that podcast, it's a great podcast where he interviews um, uh, leaders from all kinds of different professions. But if you could have any message on a billboard for thousands of people to see, what would it say? A message on a billboard for thousands of people to see. Goodness sakes. Yeah, it can be a short uh, phrase, it can be, you know, uh, something thought provoking, anything your choice. You know, I, I was always drawn to uh, Cheryl Lavender's quote about music, and I've used it a gazillion thousand times because I think she said it best, but um, it says the fact that children make beautiful music is less significant than the fact that music makes beautiful children. And I think that is why we do what we do. And so that has always been a quote that I felt is important. Uh, when I say that, usually at the end of a concert, especially for your younger kids, uh, the parents are just like, yeah, that's why we do it. That's why we support these programs, because of that. So, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, I like that one. I really like that one. Um, okay, congratulations. You've achieved Tempo Presto. Thanks for playing that little game with me. <laughs> uh, what? what what are some goals that you have either for you can you can talk about this uh, this school year or things you might be looking forward to um, your choice there? What are, what are some goals, things you're looking forward to? You know, um, my goals for this year that you put down are um, was to learn, get build better relationships with those kids that are more isolated. Um, and I'm going to do that by and we get to do lunch duty once about every six weeks, but you get one whole week of it with kids. So I'm going to try to find those kids and sit down with them at lunch and have lunch with them and ask those questions or find them in the hall or reach out to them or let parents know that, you know, hey, they did a great job in class so that I can get them to open up with me. A lot of times I think those kids don't continue my class because I don't think they have a relationship. And I hate that if that's the reason they're not continuing. But um, that's my goal. I'm going to kind of work that. Uh, the second one was to develop more brain breaks because I think the change up is important. So that's a little technical thing that goes with it. But the third one is to just continue to learn. And um, I need to sometimes when I'm being lazy, I don't go that extra mile to find out about some coral questions that I might have, or you know, investigate those things on Facebook or or YouTube or wherever. I need to do a little bit more of that, uh, just because I think I will be a better director by doing it. My problem is I do find those answers. I do find a lot of them, but I forget about what I just read about. I mean, in my old age, remember, when you get to this age. It's hard to remember stuff and, and have it stick. So, um, you know, if I can learn how to write it down and uh, or use it right away. You know, once I've discovered it, take it back into the classroom and try to work it into a, a lesson right away. So those would be my goals. 
for this. Well, this is this has been a great conversation. I think you're the perfect person after this conversation, um, just knowing and knowing you a little bit, um, that uh, you're the perfect person for this position with Southwestern ACDA. I think uh, well, you're a great, you. great repository. Yeah, you're a great repository of information and uh, tips and tricks and all the things for for those in in, uh, in that level of, of teaching and position. Uh, so thank you for joining me today. Um, where can people go to learn more about you and your work? Um, you know, I've been told I should have my own website. I don't. So, um, you know, anything of my music, you can find it in any of the music stores. So J.W. Pepper or, or Hal Leonard's websites, you can find it there. As far as about me personally, if you would like to reach out to me, my email is, I think, listed in the uh, Southwest area a website somewhere but if you can remember these letters it's my first letter initial c so c miller at heritagehall.com which is my school email and that's probably the best one for you to reach out to me um, and other than that that's about the only way you're going to find me i think so sure yeah, well we'll, sure put, you the, we'll put we'll put your email you know, terrible, you know, videos on YouTube that were <laughs> made before I knew better. But anyway, nothing bad, bad, just, you know, my hair wasn't right. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, we all, we all have those moments where we look back. Um, yeah, if you're okay with it, I'll put your, your uh, contact info yeah. in, down in the description of this video so people can look there if they, if they want to find you. Um, yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much for joining me today. And um, anything that uh, I missed that uh, you, to ask you that you, you'd like to uh, offer before we sign off here? I'm sure there will be something after we've hung up, you know, but for right now, I cannot think of anything, but I really appreciate you asking me. This has been fun.